Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and I just want to make sure before we get started that you can see my PowerPoint presentation, which is, which is still loading, and that you can hear me OK. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, there is the Q&A panel within GoToWebinar. If you're having difficulty hearing us or if you have questions along the way, please feel free to use that. Uh, we'll definitely have uh, some time towards the end to do some Q&A. Um, and if you'd like to chat with others who are on the webinar today, we have a pretty big attendance. Uh, you can also use the chat functionality. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again for joining us. And before diving into the panel today, I and this, by the way, is the second panel that we have on the topic of COVID, I thought I'd give you some background on why we're hosting this panel, and why there likely be other panels like this in, in the future. And so if we kind of go back to March, uh, Bonfire, along with many of our clients, transitioned to working remotely, uh, fully remotely, I would say. And we, during that time, we got a lot of questions from our clients asking for tips on running their processes remotely that they've always done in person, how to source PPEs, right. um, and things to that effect that you know, everyone had to kind of suddenly learn and adjust um, on a moment's notice. So at that time, we had this idea of creating a document in which we record what we've learned and so we can share it with others. And so the document got bigger and bigger, and then we had teams that began uh, to emerge, which gave us the idea of maybe having uh, a forum by which we can share some of those learnings with with clients and other clients and just so we can get um, kind of like a brain trust happening uh, as we kind of make the adjustments uh, due to COVID. So that led to our first panel webinar uh, that we hosted back in April. At that time, teams were beginning to try new digital processes like online bid openings. Others were coming up with creative ideas to meet PPE demands of their agencies, and that went really well. And so months later now, we're seeing teams from across our client base handling their entire sourcing process online. The PPE sourcing crunch seems to be uh, waning, but there are other items that are starting to be in short supply. And so in this webinar, we've teamed up with a group of innovative and very passionate uh, procurement leaders covering you know, the procurement agency spectrum uh, with the hopes of sharing common pain points and strategies uh, that they've employed to overcome uh, them and, and uh, get direct insights from them and how they were able to navigate this new normal. So we hope that you find it helpful. Um, and again, please feel free to, to join us in the chat here if you'd like to uh, kind of chime in with your thoughts as we, as we go along. Um, in terms of uh, intros, well, we have, uh, again, a group of very diverse procurement leaders that represent uh, a broad spectrum of, of agencies. Uh, first, we have joining us Mike, uh, Maya Lampinen. Maya is the procurement and contract manager for the Port of Everett. In her role, she oversees all aspects of procurement from construction, professional services, goods, and purchase services, and is heavily involved in developing and maintaining standards, policy, and procedure. She has been a member of NIGP since 2005 and uh, is actively involved in the local Washington chapter of NIGP, serving on various committees and networking groups at both local uh, and national levels. Uh, we also have uh, Christine Finney, who is the materials manager at the city of Peoria, Arizona. Uh, her 18 years in public procurement has been with a variety of agencies at the federal, state, and local levels. Her functional accountabilities include all aspects of procurement, including warehouse inventory control, bids and RFPs, vendor management, ethics budgeting, uh, and contracting for a variety of goods uh, and services, including software, professional engineering, and construction services. We also have Wendy Mitchell Brown, who has over 27 years of experience in the area of healthcare contracting, healthcare finance, and administration. Her experience includes working for a large integrated healthcare system, two Medicaid, uh, Medicaid uh, managed care organizations, pharmaceutical companies, and insurance companies. Wendy has spent the last 15 years working in the area of public procurement for the state of Delaware. She's currently the leader of the Contract Management and Procurement Unit at Delaware Department of Health and Social Services, which is the largest cabinet level agency in the state of Delaware. And last but not least, we have Eric Leaders. 
uh, who serves as the Director of Sustainability and Purchasing for the Parkway School District. Uh, and over there, he oversees all procurement functions and comprehensive sustainability initiatives for the district of 17,500 students, 3,000 employees, and 3.3 million square foot of facilities. Eric holds a master's uh, degree of business administration from Webster University, and he's an undergrad from the University of Missouri. He's also a lead accredited professional and a certified energy uh, manager. And um, I am, uh, my name is Omar Salame. I'm the chief client and product officer. I do want to thank the panelists for joining us today and taking the time uh, to discuss their insights with everyone. Um, so before diving into into the webinar, we thought just give you a super high level agenda for what we're going to cover today. Basically three themes, managing the new normal. We're going to look then at supply chain disruptions. And finally, we're going to look at navigating resource constraints that could be looming. And then we'll uh, end up with a live Q&A. Now, before we dive into the first question, we wanted to just get a sense of where everyone is at at their um, respective organizations. And we're going to do that through a quick poll. So I'm going to launch this poll uh, right now. And the question will be, what immediate operational changes did your procurement team have to make to adapt to uh, remote work? And uh, you'll be able to check multiple here. Um, and the idea, again, is to get a sense of where we're at in that shift. Um, and in the things that we have shifted, what what are we doing um, to kind of respond to COVID and the pressures that we're seeing there? And that will be a good launching point for our very first question. So we're going to leave it open for maybe, I'd say, 30 to 60 seconds, and then we'll we'll close the poll, share the results, and uh, and start the the panel. Okay, I see a lot of uh, votes and responses coming in. Maybe we'll hold it for 20 more seconds, and then we'll we'll close the poll. Okay, we have about two thirds. Okay, creeping up to three quarters. <laughs> so I want to make sure everybody has the time to to contribute, um, and I'll I'll share the results uh, now here. Okay, so what are we looking at? Um, I would say pretty even split uh, across the board. Um, it's good to see that the majority of you, 37%, close to the majority, uh, have they kind of transition seamlessly to working uh, to working from home, which is great to hear. And the 48% of adopting new team collaboration tools, that lines up very much with we, what we saw in our uh, state of the RFP study, in which more the, the telecom purchasing has gone by an average of 200% up versus the same time last year. So it's no surprise there. Um, and it's interesting to see that some are seeing temporary changes that they probably re-examine. Um, but you can see there's changes here, and a lot of people are, are working with it. And um, and again, that will be a really good segue into our first uh, question, um, which will be directed to all the panelists. And the question is, how has your organization's priorities shifted due to COVID-19? And we'll start with, with Maya on this one. So yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, I had to unmute myself there. So, OK. So with that said, um, you know, the Port of Everett was actually in the epicenter, what was originally thought of the epicenter of COVID. We are just a mile away from the hospital that was di that had the first COVID patient. So in February is when we kind of started and we were a month, I think, ahead of everybody else. And so our, we definitely switched and our, we, our priorities changed. Um, at a higher level. So those of us in the, we had, we developed a COVID task force and we were really looking at what's going on, what do, what do we need to assess? And as we were doing that, everybody else in the organization is, is, is carrying on his business as normal. And then when we, you know, mid-March when we all went home, so then they were just adapting to new work at home. So we were helping them not only respond to COVID for those folks who were still needing to be in, um, at work, but then helping everybody who didn't really quite have the setup at home work from home. But you know, our priorities are continuing to shift. We were mm -hmm. that we were at home for two weeks, and then it was four weeks, and then it was six weeks. So everyone's trying to do their normal work just remotely. And so um, as as 
I would say that almost weekly things, you know, started to shift. And so, you know, we, we declared an emergency, we waived competition, we started buying things under emergency orders, but then you start to shift back to normal and that's no longer acceptable. You can't do an emergency for how many months. It's no longer considered emergency. So um, we have limited staff in the offices. We're no longer, we're still not open to the public because we're still in a phase two here in Washington or at least in our county. And so we're working from home a couple of days a week and we're still trying to advance those priorities of our basic budgets, but those now are shifting because we're not, we're not the same as I think a lot of you are tax-based. We're revenue generating and the aerospace industry is a big part of our industry. They're a big part of our budget and they've been hit pretty hard. So we're in the same boat as you are as far as having to make cuts, but our cuts are now coming a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're looking at that. And so we're, we're, um, dropping projects, we're you know, assessing contracts, we're doing a lot of that. So I guess for me, the biggest um, keyword for this last six months has been pivot. Literally every week, every day we're pivoting, we're changing you know, directions and trying to adapt, trying to be nimble. So that's kind of how we've been operating, I think for the past six months, a little bit unsettled, but everyone's still trying to take those priorities of, of certain projects and certain initiatives and advance them forward with whatever tools we have available to us. Thanks. Thanks for that, Maya. Eric, how has it been on your end? Yeah, I think uh, there's there's probably a common theme through uh, our experience as well. Um, it's been a lot of change, and and some of that is that we have ongoing needs. So contracts expire that we need to renew because we still have facilities needs, et cetera. So so there's been some of that of we we have to maintain a certain amount of ongoing work certain new projects that are unrelated to uh, being in a school district, unrelated to a remote learning environment or PPE or re-entry. We've essentially just tried to put those on hold as much as possible uh, because we just have so much of, of new projects related to remote learning, PPE, re-entry, et cetera. So um, in, it's, it's been a lot of uh, trying to to lead from different levels, so trying to convey appropriate information to our, our senior leadership of what product lead times are looking like, or uh, trying to make an appropriate assessment of what additional products, goods, or services, or supplies that are needed. Uh, trying to provide that those recommendations as, as best we can, in in uh, in hopes to get decisions made as quickly as possible, which at, at times sometimes it, is a little, it takes a little time to, to, to come to that decision on how to best to move forward. So, um, and sometimes that's not congruent with, uh, with those products and equipment lead time. So we've been having to, to have kind of ongoing conversations with uh, different departmental uh, leadership as well for that same purpose of just trying to make sure, okay, well, with remote learning coming up here, in the fall, um, what is it that we're going to need? This uh, that that said, we're going to have to re-enter at some point. So, what additional people? So, so trying to continue to engage in those conversations throughout to uh, to ensure that we are sourcing what goods and supplies that we need has been important for us. Um, but going through this, there are have been at times that we have changed the process. Uh, similar kind of as I was mentioning, not so much of. It, uh, going a little more to an emergency phase in some instances of not as much of the standard RFX process, but uh, identifying what are their, our best options at the time, let's move forward, uh, but trying to bring it back and walk it back and, and making sure that, okay, well, how do we get back into compliance and moving forward and our time windows are, are shortening uh, with that. So, um, so it's it's been a little bit of a, a mixed process depending on what that product category, good or service, might be. Um, now I will mention that that with certain vendors that have these high demand products like PV, for us it's been pretty essential to get quick turnarounds. And that pricing sheet that Bonfire has has been a, a absolute good uh, mechanism in order to achieve some of that. Uh, but in some instances, we just had to go, you know, kind of back, revert back to, to email and phone quotes and things like that. Thanks, Eric. And how, how about your end, Christine? Uh, well, as a medium city, um, 
we're about 170,000 population for our citizens and um, as far as staff, about, about 1,100, I, I think. Um, so for us, it's kind of balancing that. So right away at the local level, you feel the economic impact right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the small businesses, local businesses, uh, I wanna say, um, you know, just in, in taking part in some of the um, leadership type meetings uh, that we immediately put together an action response team, I inserted myself into that right away because everything the city does, mm -hmm. whether it's reaching out, you know, economic development or purchasing PPE, which is obviously we're all in the same boat there. I wanted to be involved in those conversations and, um, you know, supporting local businesses was a big thing for us right away. And then also the fact that we have um, our warehouse is not that large. So trying to up our stock quantities that we're able to, um, you know, have there and then, you know, getting items where we where we can. And um, I oversee the warehouse and the mailroom as well. And those are essential. And I also um, oversee the procurement and contract side and those um, essential, but not essential to be on premise. So, we, you know, balancing that and not just in my little area, the entire city had that. So just the whole thing, taking care of our staff, making sure they're protected, taking mm -hmm. care of the citizens in any way that we can to support them um, was a big that was a big pivot for us as well, as far as mm -hmm. focusing um on that and, and you know in addition we are the public safety as well so that's going to take a big impact and they're out there you know mingling with the the public and you know the initial fear um and the initial i guess seriousness of it um you know making sure that they had everything they need so we we had to prioritize obviously all of our staff are important but our emts police uh fire are uh, you know got ppe first and so about you know balancing all of that and so it was definitely decisions every day uh, sometimes we're, you know, we're changing our decisions. We had uh, meetings every other day. And then as things started to slow down, uh, as far as the ever changing environment, yes, it did prolong. We started meeting once a week. And I think now we're kind of at actually every other week. So just, just like, like I said, like you had said, my every, every day is a pivot, you know, just mm -hmm. constantly um, readjusting our priorities and, and making sure, but we stay focused on our main goals because we're here to serve the public. Yeah, really good insights. Thanks, Christine. And I'm I'm uh, curious to hear also from from Wendy on this as somebody who works at first as a state agency, but also Department of Health and Social Services. How that impacted you uh, as well? Yeah, um, huge impact. As you mentioned, Omar, um, we are the lead agency for this pandemic response in my state. Delaware is a relatively small state, and so we don't have city health departments or county health departments. The state handles all of that, um, all of that response, that type of response. Uh, my unit, my agency, my particular, I should say, division, which is the Division of Management Services, we were deemed essential in early March. Mm -hmm. Under quote unquote normal circumstances, we are not essential employees, but we were deemed essential in March. We actually never shut our doors. Uh, we were prohibited from doing so. We did allow folks to work from home if possible, but our office was open every day, um, pretty much as normal. We did try to limit public contact wherever possible. Um, I issued an emergency order, uh, I believe it was March 5th, which allowed folks to just go out um, and buy what they needed to buy if it was directly related to COVID-19 without any type of public um, bidding process or public competition um, process that is normally required by law. I believe it was March 23rd, our governor issued a state of emergency, which first instituted the stay at home order. But secondly, and probably more importantly to my folks, part of his uh, state of emergency waived procurement law um, mm -hmm. for anything again related to COVID-19. So if they, if we were trying to procure items that were not directly related to COVID, the law still stood. We still had our normal processes in place. Um, things did definitely slow down. Our internal customers um, literally came pretty much to a halt probably around April or May-ish. But anything related to COVID as part of that state of emergency, we were allowed to just go out and buy in an open market, market fashion. Um, and that order, that emergency order is still in effect today. We are no longer under a stay at home order. I believe that ended June 15th, but the emergency declaration that gave us um, sort of the freedom to buy COVID related items, supplies and services without competition is still in effect today. Wow. Um, 
obviously our, our workload increased tremendously. We, we purchased contact tracing software. We've um, engaged various consultants to help us hire contact tracers, to help us um, better contact trace, to help us with social media messaging around COVID. Uh, we just recently launched, uh, actually, actually it might've been yesterday, we launched a uh, mobile app for contact tracing. Um, and, and that's just to name a few. Obviously we were sourcing PPE as well, um, stockpiling, which prior to COVID wasn't really my unit's function. Um, it was the function of another group of folks at the Capitol, at the state Capitol, but it kind of became the function of my folks as well. Um, most of our suppliers that we already were under contract with very early on um, were out of stock and we were not able to, to obtain what we needed from them in a timely fashion. So again, that governor's emergency order was very helpful. Uh, my emergency declaration was very helpful. People, honestly, if they were out at, at the Lowe's or at the Home Depot and they saw gloves and, and disinfectant for sale, they could pick it up you know, with a, with the state credit card and and make the purchase that way and and we did do that we did that in many cases uh, th thanks for all the information wendy it's also always interesting to see it from your point of view especially as the agency that's responsible for this and uh what you mentioned parallels some of what we heard in the first webinar of uh, with masks for example the suppliers that supply dentists are different from the ones that supply hospitals and so those right. as dentists closed down they still had supply to give out and so right. people were getting creative uh, in those ways. The theme that I detected here so far is obviously immediately we had to respond, drop everything and make that a priority. And there was an increased workload, but coupled with a different work style, like being from home. And we saw 37% of folks on the call today had everything they needed to continue that, but some has still to kind of also procure the means by which they can continue to do their work like Microsoft Teams or Zoom or something like that. Um, and so, so now that we're kind of, um, you know, that kind of rush for PPE settled and people are kind of finding their footing, what I'm curious about is, um, has the ratio of simple bids to RFPs or more strategic projects has changed even today, four or five months after COVID versus what it would have been like before? And the idea is, are we still putting strategic initiatives on hold at our agencies? Uh, are things beginning to go back to normal in terms of a more forward-looking, um, you know, initiative point of view from your internal clients? So I'll turn that question to Christine first. Um, has that ratio changed? I think I think it's normalizing now. Certainly, initially it did, um, and you know, to your point, as we as we're, I don't want to say normal, but as we get back to um, our normal, our normal, uh, focusing on what we what we need to do normally. What is our normal business function? We also handle construction in my area, and so yes, initially a lot of projects were put on hold, um, which was a bit a bit of a relief for my um, contract staff initially. But yes, now those are coming back, and um, not all of them, but they're starting to come back. Certainly, uh, with a lot of the initiatives that we have taken to engage our community, there were uh, RFPs for that. Um, you know, we, we need to do market research and figure out where everybody where everybody is. So there are new RFPs for that. We, uh, you know, contracts for COVID testing. You know, so there there's certainly I, I would say there has probably been an increase in al alternative projects, things that we don't normally uh, see every day. But now mm -hmm. that we're we're sort of um, getting back to maybe we're starting to see a few more revenues. We're certainly not out of the woods yet, but um, capital projects are coming back. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting over the next couple of months to see how things go. Also, my area handles, we have a lot of community events. And if we're allowed to start going, you know, creating an art, an art fair or, or, you know, we've got, um, you know, with fall coming up, we, we have kind of a Halloween bash. If we're able to do that, those agreements come through our area as well. And that will pick back up. So um, I would say the ratio has probably increased a little bit and it will probably continue to increase. Thanks, Christine. Uh, how about on your end, Eric, as, especially in a, in a school district setting? Yeah, so for us, it's, um, it's, there hasn't been so much of a return to normal. I think that, that uh, a lot of projects were, strategic projects were put on hold um, and, and just being from, from budget-minded as well as priority 
very much like COVID and reentry, et cetera. So um, with, with summer break, it's, you know, there is opportunity then to try to reassess of what's needed for fall. Uh, we were originally planning for a, a August reentry of students in full. And then with this spike that we're happening, uh, as, as many states have experienced, so we, we uh, pushed that back. And so it went 100% virtual. And then now we're considering looking at a, a hybrid model uh, in potentially October. So uh, there, there's, there continues to be these different iterations of important and pending deadline dates that, that uh, are coming up. And so with each one of those dates, it brings on a new set of uh, needs, goods, services, et cetera, that we need to get in place. So a lot of our, our kind of our strategic non-COVID related stuff is definitely still on hold um, beyond the, the, the kind of cycles of uh, contracts that we're still trying to maintain because we still, we still need those goods and services. So, but, um, we've definitely been very much more focused on uh, going through those those procurement functions for things related to virtual learning or in part of that uh, summer uh, summer virtual learning, et cetera. So there's there's been a, a lot kind of surrounding those needs. Um, so I think when when we're actually the the dust will settle will will possibly be October. Um, and then we we might be reassessing at that point over you know when can we kind of readdress these things that just kind of hit the the back burner for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the sense that I got is even though we're like five months into it now, there's still it's not obviously back to normal from a wider setting, but even from an operational setting, it's still reactive. We're still adjusting things. Um, there's a bit of an unknown still. But there is maybe some return to normalcy in some initiatives, but at large we're still reactive, um, which which makes a lot of sense. So that kind of covers the the operational aspect in terms of what what we're doing, what we're being asked to do. Uh, next, we're going to shift with this question on on the how. Um, and again, in the first webinar that we held on COVID, I believe it was 92% of people at the time were either working full time from home or part time from home, and so. On, on um, other sessions that we've had, that uh, percentage fluctuated, but it's still very high. And so with, with work becoming more virtual, um, how has it impacted the relationship with your uh, key stakeholders, internal clients, and upper management? And this question was going to Wendy, but I know, Wendy, from your point of view, you're kind of in the, uh, in the office. If you've seen it maybe with other teams, you can comment on that. We can certainly get uh, some of the other panelists chime in too if you want to reflect on that experience. Sure. We 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 are and always have been in the office. However, um, although the building, as I said, was never closed, we did attempt to limit public contact mm. uh, for obvious reasons. And so, you know, it, it, it was very interesting. Um, we were implementing bonfire just as this was happening. Prior to bonfire, our folks, our, our bidders, our usual contractors and bidders were used to coming into our building to hand deliver proposals, for example. And so um, again, the building pretty much was closed to the public, but not closed. Um, we didn't mm -hmm. allow anyone beyond the off, beyond the lobby. Um, you were required to wear a mask, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it was kind of interesting. Even once we implemented bonfire, I had many days I had to meet a potential vendor or an existing vendor or contractor in the lobby and explain to them that you know we don't take hand delivered packages any longer that you need to go to bonfire you need to go to our normal website there's a link there to bonfire etc cetera, etc cetera. um our our folks are just very used to um you know doing business the old fashioned way with a handshake and a and a and a physical meeting um, and a cup of coffee and that kind of thing. And it just isn't the way we do business any longer. We had quite a few frantic phone calls from bidders who I guess had not paid attention to our webpage prior because we gave pretty good notice that we were going fully remote and fully electronic. And um, they found themselves panicked because they you know, really felt like they could not do it electronically, they could not do it well, and they could not do it timely. 
believe it or not, we have a, a kind of interesting story of one vendor who hand walked in, handed to someone a um, a bid, did not hand it to someone from my group. He handed it to someone else in another part of the building somehow. She got it to us um, in time for the bid deadline, but again, we weren't accepting hard copies. And so one of my staff got on the phone to the gentleman and told him, you know, what was going on. He actually went to our bonfire hub page on his smartphone in his pickup truck and was able to complete the information and upload all his documents in less than an hour and was able to successfully bid. Um, so that just goes to show you how good and how easy bonfire is. That's great. Shameless to hear, plug, yeah. shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's definitely an adjustment. And um, I'm curious to hear from, from others too who had to work fully uh, remote as well. And maybe we'll, we'll kind of shift and phrase the question a little bit differently. Will telecommu uh, telecommuting ultimately be the new norm? Uh, and is your organization willing to change and adapt? Um, especially now that we've kind of undergone like a, a global experiment in which a whole bunch of us were forced to do it. And I mean, at least when you, when you hear and you read the news, it seems to be most people are finding more productivity, better, you know, work-life balance, they spend more time with their kids, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of discovered the benefit of that. Um, but I'm curious, organizationally speaking, do you think telecommuting is here to stay? And maybe we'll, we'll start with Maya on this one. Sure. Yeah, I think a variation of telecommuting is here to stay for sure. Um, there are a lot of jobs, as we know, that aren't well suited for telecommuting and um, especially and then their supervisors sometimes can't. You know, if you have maintenance guys, if you have operational staff that are in the buildings, it's a little bit challenging to to, to 100 percent telecommute. It also requires a huge mind shift change um, and a lot of extra work to maintain relationships. So not bad, but just a difference, a difference. And so um, and I think it'll be really interesting after COVID is done what the difference is because with COVID you know we're all we've got kids at home we've got everything else going on they're distance learning there's a lot going on so it's maybe not exactly how it's going to be but I do think there's a lot of um, organizations and agencies that are willing to look at this in the future I know that the port for instance is in the process of updating our telecommute policy so those of us who do have the ability to telecommute can do so one to two days a week um, then the end the they they really want to make sure that we still have in-person interactions we've really missed that um, we're a small staff, so I know the other ones on the panel here are a little bit larger. We have 90, 90 staff members right now because we have 10 positions on free, you know, freeze just due to the budget issues. So um, we're very open. We're updating our policy. And then um, what I think we're going to see is some flexibility, too. When there's inclement weather days, when someone has a cold, they just don't want to spread those germs around the office, um, they have that ability because they've proven that they can do it. And um, so what we're doing is we're trying to adapt at this at the port where we've um, already done maybe most of our conference rooms, at least in our administrative type areas, are now completely ready for video conferencing. So mm -hmm. if I'm homesick and I have to participate in a meeting, they can send me a Zoom link and I'm I'm part of the meeting. So mm -hmm. I, I can definitely see that. Um, and then I think from a um, from a procurement perspective, you know, we've gone to online bid openings, online pre-bid meetings as much as possible. Construction meetings are a little bit more challenging that way, um, but I've got very positive feedback from our vendors that they, and suppliers and contractors, that they really like the efficiencies, have been able to log in from their office, attend a, pre, an, an a bid opening, and that they're not driving 20 minutes. or in the Seattle traffic area, sometimes an hour to, to deliver a bid and or open it. So we're really, um, I see some of those things moving forward as part of the new norm. Yeah, th thanks, Maya. Um, yeah, and that, that really lines up well with what we've heard uh, across the board. Um, so unless there's any more comments from the panelists on the topic of that change, we're going to shift into the, the other theme today. Uh, which is, if my uh, PowerPoint cooperates here, supply chain disruptions. The pattern is going to be the same. We're going to start with a poll, uh, and then and then we'll turn to the question. So this poll here uh, is: Are supply chain disruptions a challenge for your procurement team in 2020, or have they been? Do you kind of continue them, uh, see, seeing them as being challenges? Uh, and then let me just quickly launch that one, uh, and the options here are going to be, we have been experiencing shortages since the start of COVID, 
we were experiencing shortages, but now we're not. Uh, and we were good the whole time. Um, and that, again, will set us nicely for the next set of questions. Wow, this, uh, it's interesting to see how the, the results are coming in and how, um, how different this poll is to the last one. It's definitely um, a little bit less spread out, as you'll see in a bit. Uh, we have about 50% uh, so far people voted, so maybe we'll open it up. Uh, for 20 more seconds, and then we'll share the results with, with everyone. Oh, yeah, you know, somebody somebody mentioned, yeah, the last two options are the same. Um, good point. I think that was just a typo here. The last one was supposed to read, we never experienced any supply shortages. So you you didn't have any, any issues so far as what the last one should have been. Um, I appreciate that. Okay, so on this on this note, we're gonna close the the poll and share the results. Even though there was a mix up there, I think people maybe saw the slide earlier, and um, and this is what we kind of saw and we would expect it to see that very few people did not experience any shortage, which is that last option here, um, and it seems to be a split between uh, those who have experienced it in the beginning. Uh, but not anymore. And I think that would probably, anecdotally, that's probably some of the PPEs in some organizations. It seems those supply chains or hand sanitizer, for example, um, I'm certainly seeing it everywhere here where three months ago it was it was a different story. Um, and so, so that, again, sets us nicely for the next set of questions here. And the first one is uh, going go to go to, to Eric. How does your team continue to manage supply chain limitations? And I'm specifically curious, again, because of the school district nature uh, and the fact that you have to supply a lot more than uh, maybe a typical organization does. Yeah, so um, it's been a little bit of a, a challenge. I mean, everyone's experienced the, the, the PPE shortages, I believe. So um, that, that I think was a, a big issue with us. So it's not not just, individual you know sanitizer and masks etc but uh, how do we how do we outfit our classrooms that are going to be safe and what does that entail so um trying to work with different suppliers and what those options are some suppliers are, are just they're, they're popping up out of the woodwork uh, other suppliers i mean they're they're trying to sell stuff right so it's they're, they're selling the um you know the the uv things that they might potentially work effectively in HVAC units, but not so much in the individual space. Long story short, like it, it's trying to sift through the, the noise between what works, what doesn't work, and working with our internal uh, health services department and facilities department to identify those solutions and then uh, work back with our suppliers and, and what is available. Uh, there's, there's, there were some issues early on that we had some, some long, trusted suppliers that in which they, they couldn't respond to our bids. Uh, they they just they claimed they didn't have enough time, that there was too too intensive. So um, that's something we had to adapt to of trying to push these out in a a less cumbersome fashion so that we would get better responses and from from more trusted suppliers. Uh, after initial hand sanitizer push and other PVE push that we had for disinfectant wipes, et cetera, um, trying to realized that it's some some of the product that we that we had ordered we we had to split you know half to low bid half to more trusted supplier which is a higher bid low bid being say uh, uh import company or a broker of sanitizer and pb etc we've never done business with before uh product was well was late you know significantly late and uh you know we we were apprehensive on, on whether or not that it would meet the the FDA claims that it had had indicated, and so ultimately it did, which is all fine and good. But um, when we're looking at kind of a, a new reentry of of trying to ensure that we that we have enough supply for for months to come, once when students get back into school, uh, we kind of changed our approach a little bit of looking to do more of of invitation for bid instead of just doing a completely public bid. Uh, process that, that anyone can can submit a bid for just to make sure that again we, we have specific lead time requirements and we have specific product specification requirements that 
Uh, oftentimes these brokers are, or had, at least for us, sent in just kind of like some typed up information as opposed to true manufacturer specifications, et cetera. So we've had to kind of work with existing suppliers and do a little bit of a trial by fire of, of trying to find our best bid pricing because the sheer quantity of stuff that we're buying is 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 pretty substantial. So we wanted to use our get the absolute very best price, but with that came some risk. So I think we we've kind of found our or at least our present day uh, balance point of of how we're trying to handle that. Um, so that's that's how we're trying to work with some of those existing suppliers and and trying to 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 always have a conversation of what's immediately available. Uh, when we need it and ask those questions and being prepared to make that purchase in, in whatever mechanism that we need to, uh, which was vision, which being if we were going to confirm via email or, or verbally in place that verbal order to ensure that we get supply uh, on order of what it is that we originally were quoted for, as opposed to waiting for another day or two to go through a re requisition PO approval process. Uh, the, that by at which point the products may no longer be available or may not be available at that price point. So um, we, we've had to, again, kind of, as I said more in the year, be nimble and flexible with, with how we're able to uh, work with suppliers, work within our best practices and, and find the best route that kind of uh, checks all the boxes. Thanks, Eric. And, and the one thing that we've heard, um, the procurement teams were kind of the sober minded part of this when there was a rush to go and buy anything we can get our hands on it was all the procurement teams that said you know there's specs that we need to follow we need to make sure that there's msds sheets that where these are going to be safe for our, our students or constituents um i've heard stories of you know again in that mad rush to get uh masks they were asking can you send me a picture of the factory in china in which you're getting this from and based on the pictures alone they decided not to buy um you know the safety procedures were evident in the picture <laughs> or like thereof mm. um and to me that just highlights the reason why i mentioned that is the strategic nature of the procurement function in the middle of this kind of rush to buy there was the sober mindedness there to kind of pause and, and make sure that um we're not just filling the warehouse but we're filling it with with good stuff mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, COVID definitely surfaced a lack of capacity and collaboration supply chains. We've heard of stories where within the same state, you know, different agencies were kind of racing to get the supplies or between states that was happening. Um, and this is more of a, I guess, higher level question, but what do you think the, the learnings that the industry uh, should take forward to ensure a resilient supply chain based on the challenges that you've had? And um, we'll pose that one to Christine. Sure. Um... You know, it's it's interesting to listen to some of the examples that you guys are giving um, with uh, the, the supply, the, all the, the emails that you would get from suppliers that you're not sure if they're real or not. And um, it just, I have a lot of similar examples. And I, th I think maybe my advice for the industry would be, um, again, to just, you know, keep an open mind. You talked about being nimble, Eric, and that's actually, I mean, that's the key. Uh, I did things in a way that I, that I didn't, I don't think I ever thought I would. In, in, in my level, I certainly don't know about sanitizers and what, you know, percent alcohol and, um, you, but, but making ourselves aware of that and making sure that we're not, we're not passing off that responsibility to somebody else because I don't know who that somebody else would be if it's not me and my, my warehouse supervisor, right. making sure that we're buying the right products and, um, and you know, learning from our mistakes. We've made a couple mistakes along the way and bought products that weren't quite right and we have not really gotten burned too bad. But so it's just doing your best. You talked about, um, you know, best practices, the best possible practices that we can and making sure, obviously we have to be accountable. It's gotta be auditable at the end of the day. And we're all kind of in the same, boat with the emergency level that we were at in the beginning of this but um you know just having a level head trying to keep a cool head i don't know how many emails i i, I got from suppliers that i was really i was questioning so figuring out how to make sure that this is a good supplier because maybe they do have masks that i need and you know requesting their w9 right away and not getting a response why well, you know that that was a quick way to sort of sift through that and um you know i guess it just 
being, I guess, being flexible, but responsible and just making sure that at the end of the day, uh, we're still here to, the taxpayers um, expect us to be professional and fiduciary and, and, and just, just balancing, I guess, both of those, both of those elements of what we do. To thinking back a little bit more on that, I think that, that yeah, I mean, kind of being thing that that's so reminded in department, right? So um, uh, having that healthy sense of skepticism that anything they may come across our desk, either from an an, an you know a parent urgent request from an internal customer or from a vendor, um, just just making sure that that we ask the right questions and knowing what questions to ask, even though we're not necessarily subject matter experts in, in, any, in, in many of these particular areas. So um, in, in working with our facilities department, et cetera. So uh, especially within school districts, like, you know, the, a lot of the uh, typical decentralized purchasing needs that may have occurred by, you know, a, what we would call budget secretary or, or even from like some building administration, this is not categories that they're familiar with. So we've had to kind of re-centralize a lot of purchasing of certain product categories that they otherwise would just to make sure that we have that certain degree of oversight to make sure that, you know, teachers aren't getting a bunch of bleach to use in their classrooms because that's 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 not the route that we, we want to go. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, as well, Eric. Now we have a, a question uh, about co-ops next but in the interest of time what i'm going to do is do two things at once um flip to the next agenda uh, item and launch that uh, that poll and this one is about co-ops the poll and so we'll be we'll just kind of talk about it eric as we um as we have uh, the poll launch there and the whole idea behind this next theme is navigating resource constraints um again we've talked about maybe budgets are being on a hold we're not able to hire people um, so that's kind of the theme here. And the question is to uh, the attendees is um, what innovative strategies have you used or, and or are planning to use to drive uh, savings? Again, with this idea of resource constraint. Um, and as we have the poll here, um, Eric, I know we talked about this uh, quite a bit before, but do you see the use of cooperative purchasing or utilizing maybe piggybacking or collaboration among organizations uh, increasing, uh, again, giving some of those constraints and even some of the issues that we had with, um, you know, kind of multiple organizations wanted to go buy the same thing and kind of competing with each other. Yeah, so um, our perspective with cooperatives is, is, is that they are a useful tool, um, especially for, for urgent requests and urgent needs, um, provided that the co-op as well as the the, the contracts and vendor within the co-op are reputable, so um, which which could potentially take some time to vet. So throughout this period of time, we've been using those already vetted vendors through already vetted co-ops to ensure that they, that everything is essentially on the up and up. Um, it's it's a great tool for us. It may not always be the most cost competitive option. We often find that if we conduct our own bid for a similar good or service, the work may yield a better price. Not always, but often. Um, that, that said, if there is an urgent need, like being able to, to rely on some of those, uh, those cooperative contracts has been uh, really critical. And I think we're, we're going to continue to, to use it as a tool that, that we can in those instances. Um, so, so that way that we're able to, to quickly respond to those needs and identify what the, that pricing is, um, that they might, that a vendor that is, that we are full uh, aware of and, and what have the contract information of, we can ask them, give me a quick quote on this. If it's good enough for us and meets our budget, then we'll just go ahead and drive on as opposed to, um, you know, going through that, that formal bid process that, that may take, you know, days or, or weeks or something to that effect. So um, I think it's a, it's a great tool. We're going to continue to utilize them as such. Um, and, and I think it's a, uh, it's a great way to, stay in compliance as well from, from a procurement standpoint or, or a bidding standpoint. Um, while to so currently stay in compliance and then if that's something we seek to bid out ourselves moving forward to yield a better pricing, we can do that and we have that flexibility, we can do that over time. Yeah, and so thanks for that. And what you're saying lines up uh, with the results which I'll launch here 
uh, for the uh, for the audience to see, uh, so 55%, and this one where you can select multiple so they won't add up to 100, uh, are you're going to be utilizing piggyback contracts. 82% uh, are saying the same thing as you were saying, Eric, cooperative purchasing is going to be one of the strategies. Creative purchasing vehicles we'll dig into a little bit more uh, in the next few questions, and but it's interesting, cost savings is a priority, uh, just taking the negative of this uh, across across the board. Um, which is again a great segue into our, our next question, which is going to be to Christine. What pressure is procurement under uh, to drive additional savings due to potential revenue uh, shortfalls? Absolutely, and we're certainly experiencing that here. Um, it's you know um, I think with with um, with the revenue shortfalls, you know, looking at it, saving money, kind of has to be balanced with also, you know, what you know what do we need? Certainly, um, piggybacking and co-oping onto contracts is um, a way to get what we need quickly. But um, if if it's not proving to be cost effective, it might be um, a better option to look at what we can do on our own, whether or not that's you know obtaining quotes or or doing an RFP. Um, um, as far as um, everything that, that we're doing here to try to um, cut costs, it's not, it's not that it isn't a huge priority, it's just that there are, the breadth and depth of, of what we need to be doing to respond to our community is complex. And so that, you know, that involves consultants and it, it involves, um, you know, sometimes negotiating um, pricing. So, you know, we certainly are doing the best we can with that. We always have. And in order to be um, a strategic partner in our organization, we want to make sure that that is in the front of our mind. But we also look at best value uh, in everything that we do. And, you know, trying to make sure people understand that. Uh, we certainly don't want any um, $600 hammers, uh, but we certainly want to make sure that we um, that we're, I guess, uh, balancing, you know, best value with with the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Christine. And uh, staying on the same topic of, of savings, uh, this one is for Maya. What strategies has your team deployed to increase savings during this time? Yeah, so actually I'm in a little bit different situation than like Eric and Christine, and I'm assuming Wendy, you're in a larger organization too. Being in a small organization and being a single procurement shop, Cooperative contracts actually for us are an economies of scale because for me to go out and bid something in my little world is going to be a little bit different. It's definitely doable and it's definitely can have some savings. But for us, those cooperative pur um, purchasing cooperatives are actually for us quite beneficial, um, not only for delivery, but just to take advantage of all of your guys' spend as well. So, but with that, what we've been doing too, we've been talking a lot with our end users about reviewing our particular existing contracts. Cause you know, everything that's in place is in place for a reason. And, but is there a way that we can kind of save where we're at? So for example, um, you know, our, our mats, we have a laundry service for our walk-off mats. Do they need to be every week? Or can we do that once a month? So those are some of the conversations we're having. Are we going to realize a lot of savings there? Maybe not, but every little bit of savings helps. And I think what it also does is it helps the morale of all the staff realizing that they're pulling together and that they're making decisions to help benefit the bottom line. So we're doing that. We're also talking with some of our existing suppliers saying, is this the best way to provide this service? Or is there a better way that we can do this? Um, I'm also doing a lot of buying of used equipment versus buying brand new. So little things like that, that I'm what we're trying to do at this particular time is saying, okay, I need a fuel truck, but I don't need a brand new fuel truck. $200,000 versus $30,000. Mm -hmm. That at this point makes the most sense for us. So we're doing that. And then one of the interesting things one of my colleagues at a neighboring agency is doing is they're actually looking at outsourcing some of their functions, um, such mm -hmm. as park operation and management of parks. So I've been watching that. It's still, it's a P3 request for proposal that's out on the street, but doing something like that in, a, in situations like this, it, it just seems like a, Sometimes the private sector is better handled, I mean, better equipped to handle some of the, the stuff that we're doing. So those are some of the things that we're kind of looking at as far as cost savings. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, especially the example of starting with, at the needs level, do we need this? And as opposed to just, once we haven't even questioned that, now we're trying to find the best you know, negotiation strategy. Uh, we're eliminating it at the, at the get-go. Um, with the, in the interest of time, and leaving some time for the Q&A to come in, I'm going to focus on more on the creative and innovative sourcing methods 
um, that maybe some of you have used in the past or maybe planning on using uh, in the future. And so are there any creative and innovative methods that you would recommend, Christine? And then we'll go over to Wendy after that. Sure, absolutely. Um, I heard it mentioned in the in the beginning a little bit about you mentioned the dental supplier. Um, you know, that's it's 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 innovative to think that I would be doing business with a dental supplier. The city of Peoria has nothing to do with providing dental services, but you know, um, as far as you know, availability of items, that's certainly one one area where we have um, done done things quite a bit differently. Another might be engaging your local community um, your your local businesses figuring out uh, what ways can can they um, feel like they're part of the solution with us not just the recipients of maybe some of the benefits that we're able to provide back to them um, certainly innovative that way and another might be you know we talked a little bit about um, looking for alternative ways to um, to purchase things also um, with uh, with regard to auctions and recycling, um, you know, making being accountable for those and, and figuring out if maybe there's a better way that we can do um, an auction or or a bid rather than sending it off to an auction um, house, maybe with something that we can handle um, on our own, and um, just obviously empl employing the use of technology. You know, we I think we're all in the same boat there. I know that the city was getting ready to launch uh, teams throughout the year here, I think they fast tracked that and thank goodness they did, you know, to be able to uh, continue doing what we need to do, continue with our projects and continue collaborating. Thank you, Christine. Uh, great ideas. And and Wendy, uh, from your perspective, are there any other strategies that come to mind that you're employing or planning on to? Just, just a couple. Um, we, we actually employ both of these. One is what we have called or what we have termed an open and continuous bid. Instead of releasing um, individual bids, sometimes uh, multiple years in a row or every six months or what have you, our law does allow this. Um, we we uh, implement a bid process and I guess for lack of a better word, we never close it. Lack of a better term, we never close it. We leave it open and it just has periodic openings at set intervals, like every 60 days, every 90 days, every 180 days. And so what it does is it creates a list of vendors. It may not be for an immediate need um, mm -hmm. and there may be bid opening dates for which we don't receive any, any proposals possibly. Um, and let's just say, for example, a bid opening date was today and a vendor missed it. They would just wait till the next 90 days or 60 days or whatever it may be and submit the proposal at that time. So it saves us a little time and work of, of having to uh, reinitiate that process over and over again. Um, the other thing we do, it's a little different in nature, is we, not in all cases, but in some cases have held what we call a pre-release meeting. Um, we were finding, particularly with one of our agencies, that um, we would have a, a, a bidders meeting, a regular bidders meeting, and through the bidders meeting, the agency would actually learn details and, and, and policy information from the attendees that informed their RFP or their ITB. And, mm -hmm. and then they'd have to kind of backtrack and, and revise it. So rather than have it happen that way, what we started doing, particularly if they were very sensitive um, issues or, or highly visible um, procurements uh, with the public sensitivity to them, we would have what was called a pre-release meeting. It was open to the public. Anyone could come, a potential bidder, a non-potential bidder, a member of the general public or what have you. They could voice their opinions and concerns. And, and in some cases, as I said, they could voice their ideas for how we should do things. And then we would allow that meeting to inform the creation of the RFP or the ITB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are great ideas. And that one also, the last idea you mentioned there, Wendy, is being experimented with in Ontario. Uh, there's it's ah. something similar for very complex IT purchases. They call it like a dialogue right. approach, multiple dialogues right. along the way. Um, right. We're, we're at two o'clock, but I want to make sure if it's okay with the panelists to just maybe stick around for a couple of minutes, see if there's any questions that have come in or will come in from uh, our attendees today. So 
this is your chance, uh, those in attendance, to ask us uh, any questions. Um, and there's thank yous coming to the attendees. I'm not sure if you can see the comments that I can, but people are very thankful for uh, for your time today. Um, just on the ideas front, a couple that I want to share that I heard from other clients, uh, the city of Louisville speaking to engaging local suppliers. Um, you know, catering companies were were obviously uh, hurt during this the, the pandemic. At the same time, there were long-term care facilities that were were needing food or shelters that were needed food, and so they basically connected the dots there. They they started buying food from the catering companies, directing mm -hmm. directing it towards the shelters. There were shops uh, there for textiles, so they were starting to manufacture masks uh, in the city as well. Um, one other idea that we heard was uh, in healthcare and long-term care facilities, um, those bedside tables that you used to eat off of immediately became in short supply. Basically, all the supply in the market was absorbed. And so, so a creative solution was like, well, what we need is a flat top, basically, and there's like these TV dinner tables that you can buy. Uh, readily more available than, and so so it was just really interesting to see the reactions and how creative uh, teams were were being across the board. Um, so the one question that we did uh, get, and uh, I'm not sure who who is best to comment on this. Could they briefly discuss contact uh, tracing software? Um, I know it was mentioned earlier today. Um, any volunteers to take this one on? Sure. Um, as I think I mentioned, we uh, procured a PC-based contact tracing software. It's a company called Innovational, um, Innovation with an E. Um, I'm not actually sure how we found that company. I, I had no hand in that. I believe our public health director, um, a physician, somehow came across that software. As far as I know, it is working well. As I said yesterday, we implemented a mobile contact tracing software that was actually with a company out of Ireland called Nearform. Um, they are they are implementing, or actually they have already implemented that same mobile contact tracing app in Pennsylvania. And I believe either Maryland is right behind us or also has been implemented as well. So for those of you that are not familiar geographically, we are connected to Maryland and Pennsylvania geographically. And so, although we all did individual contracts, we did consciously do it uh, with the same company because we have people every day that cross the borders between Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware, and, and actually New Jersey, but New Jersey, for whatever reason, at least as of yet, has not joined in. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's a company called Nearform. It was released um, originally in Ireland. From what we understand, it was working well there. And I don't really have much to tell you on how it's working here, because as I said, it was just launched yesterday. Oh, that's great, great feedback and information, Wendy. Uh, we had no more questions coming in, so I don't want to take more time from the panelists and the attendees, but I want to extend a huge thank you for, for you panelists today to join us and share your ideas and feedback. Um, it sounds like the... Um, the audience really enjoyed the information. There is a survey for those who are in attendance today after. If you have any other questions, you can certainly type them through here. We'll do our best to give you a response. Again, thank you so much. And if you enjoyed this, let us know. And we'll keep doing it if you find it helpful. The, the beautiful thing about procurement teams is they're all willing to help. And they all come together in times like this. Um, and that's something that we'd be happy to do, just connecting the dots among our client base. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the panelists and hope you stay safe and we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye.